privileged for the Faculty of Political Science Summit at University um, to be hosting a book launch. Um, the title is Thai Politics, Democracy and Its Discontent. The topic is, of course, very timely and interesting, and I'm sure a lot of you will have a lot of questions to ask afterwards. Okay, the format of this book launch would be um, Professor Daniel Amer and Professor Chantranuk Mahalakanchana will talk a little bit about the book, probably like 60 to 75 minutes, and then we'll open the floor uh, for the questions. Okay, and afterward, maybe you would allow for some interview in case you want to you know, have a more in-depth discussion with both professors. Okay, um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Daniel Amer. Um, he has a PhD in political science from UC Berkeley. And the, um, the title of his dissertation, which uh, may I, um, Japan, the Overseas Chinese, and Industrialization in Thailand. So obviously you have quite an interest in Thailand for quite a while. Um, his teaching career, um, before joining Tamasa, he was teaching at the Department of Political Science in Northern Illinois University in the US. And he joined Tamasa in 2015. Um, before that, even before um, Northern Illinois University, um, he was an adjunct professor at Brunswick University as well as Thomas Art University back in during 2006 and 2008. Um, and Professor Chantra, uh, Chantra excuse me, Maha Ganjana, um, she has a PhD in political science from Northern Illinois University in 2004. Her um, thesis title is Municipal Government, Social Capital and Decentralization in Thailand with a postdoc um, titled Decentralization, Local Government, and Socio-Political Conflict in South Thailand from the East-West Center in Washington State. Um, her teaching career, she joined the National Institute of um, Development Administration in 2004 and is now holding position of director of the Master of Public and Private uh, Management Program in Chonburi <coughs> Province um, for the Graduate School in Public Administration. Um, both professors have interest in local governments, decentralization, obviously democratization, comparative politics in general. And today um, they'll be talking about their latest book, um, High Politics Between Democracy and Its Discontent. And without further ado, I would like to invite you to discuss about your book. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's really fun to be here. Um, I would like to thank. Uh, the, in a general way, uh, well, we're going to be leaving Thailand quite soon, so uh, my connection with uh, the faculty here is coming to at least a temporary end. I'd like to thank the faculty for letting me be a member of the community for a while. Uh, I'd like to thank Ajahn Pinikhan for helping to arrange that and this talk, Ajahn Pachari for having given me a chance to teach at Thamasat some 50 years ago, whatever that was. Um, it's very nice. Our, um, our book tries to do a couple of things. The first is to understand why entrenching democracy in Thailand, uh, especially a high quality liberal democracy, has been relatively difficult. And then the second is to explain, understand some of the ways in which uh, democracy in Thailand has both strengthened um, and deteriorated this uh, century, that story of the simultaneously strengthening on some, in some respects and the weakening in, in others of democracy as we understand it uh, is largely, in substantial part anyway, the story of complexity. We can sum up the first point that democracy has been a rough slog in Thailand by citing um, well-known research, I'm sure that's familiar with some of you, 25, 30 years ago, um, an article that got a lot of attention asserting that sustain sustainable democracy was associated with level of per capita income. Richer countries, in richer countries, democracies fail less frequently. Um, so when this research attained prominence, there was only one case of a country where um, democracy had failed, where the per capita income had been above 4,000 U.S. dollars. This is 1985 U.S. dollars. Um, that was Argentina. 
Uruguay uh, was a case where democracy had failed once per capita income was above 4,000 US dollars, just above 4,000. And then there were four other cases, Fiji, uh, Suriname, Greece, uh, Chile, where democracy had failed when its per capita income had been above the $3,000 per capita income, again in 1985 U.S. dollars. All other cases of democratic failures had been at lower levels of per capita income. So when Thailand had its coup in 2014, Thailand's per capita income, as measured in 1985 U.S. dollars, was above that $4,000 threshold is a long way of saying that Thailand joined rather select company uh, in terms of countries that were quite prosperous but unable to make a go of it with democracy. Some of you are probably already thinking that I mean, we're citing this article in passing uh, from a generation ago and there's quite a few other cases that may have also joined Thailand. Uh, think of Russia, Turkey, Venezuela, all of those are cases that we might argue where democracy has failed and where per capita incomes have been uh, above those thresholds. Um, more generally, we could argue, uh, and we're not going to make a detailed case here, but you can, a number of scholars have tried to count numbers of regime transitions. And you know, it depends on how you do the counting, how you operationalize these questions, but often, Thailand is way up there. If we, if we have 1932 as our beginning year, Thailand is up there with Argentina as one of the countries that's had one of the most, uh, the largest numbers of regime shifts. So our second concern that uh, I mentioned a moment ago is to understand the ways in which Thailand's democracy has both gotten stronger and uh, has in other respects deteriorated during this uh, century. We see Thailand as, in the course of this century, having become, if, with the exception of some coup periods, uh, having become more democratic in the sense that elections are more consequential. People are uh, seem to be voting more in ways that tend to be conducive to responsive democratic government. Uh, more Thais seem to believe that their vote means something. So more democratic, and at the same time, Thailand seems to have been growing less liberal. Rule of law, perhaps, having atrophied uh, somewhat. Elections taking on the quality of plebiscites. Um, are you for Toxin or against him? And uh, certainly the importance of parliament is nothing like as great as it was at the end of the last century. It's just not really an arena for real political action. Um, Democrats, people who are concerned especially with uh, the people's voice guiding government action, and liberals, people who are concerned with rule of law, uh, people whose strongest political commitments tend to be to preserving liberties, especially against the infringement by government. So Democrats on the one hand, liberals on the other hand, they obviously can and do live together in matrimonial bliss uh, in a number of cases, quite a number of cases. On the other hand, there are tensions between the two principles, the democratic principle and the liberal principle. Um, and uh, if we look at European cases in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, there are many examples where those two Principles, the two parties representing the democratic principle, the liberal principle, were in contention with one another. Um, John Stuart Mill, a name many of us know, um, was a liberal. He was a Democrat, but he was perhaps a liberal first, and uh, he couldn't help drawing our attention to the fact that it was the peasants. French peasants who made Louis Napoleon an emperor. Give them the vote, look what happens. They decide to make this guy an emperor. Tocqueville, another liberal, worried about the faith of the masses in the United States. He was convinced that America, the Americans were so taken with public opinion that they regarded it as a form of religion. 
they're going to be able to deliberate complex issues with these attitudes, Tocqueville wondered. Mill also worried about conformity in societies in which now people read the same thing, listen to the same things, see the same things. John Stewart, if you could be with us now, what nightmares you would be experiencing. Um, another liberal, uh, William Lecky, uh, worried that the most ignorant classes were more apt to follow with an absolute devotion some strong reader, with the resulting spectacle of dishonest and predatory adventurers climbing by popular suffrage into positions of great power. All of these were liberal concerns. Um, and um, generally speaking, I mean, these are all uh, English examples I just gave. But uh, in many European cases, in most European cases, the liberals ended up being driven out. Not necessarily their principles, but their parties. Liberal parties generally disappeared. Uh, democracy triumphed, although in many cases these democratic parties incorporated liberal principles. In Thailand, it seems to us that some of the past champions of uh, democracy were largely sidelined for their commitments uh, to liberal principles. Hoxton was able to claim the democratic mantle in Thailand, and in many cases, <coughs> certainly not in all cases, but in many uh, cases, Hoxton, the Democrat, uh, the liberals, um, were with the intention of the um, We argue in this book that in the past in Thailand, uh, and really we're suggesting that this goes back at least until the 1970s, there was a fairly durable elite consensus about the nature of Thai politics. Where the direction in which Thai politics was moving, the direction in which people wanted it to be moving, disagreements about the pace of change, but not so much um, explicit difference about where Thailand stood and where the direction in which it was headed. Um, that consensus, it seems to us, has weakened considerably. There used to be more agreement, now there is less. Um, I don't know, uh, as we think about this issue, well, perhaps really all we're saying, I'm not sure if uh, we're saying something that amounts to more than this or not, but perhaps all that we're saying is that um, there was one prominent hierarchy in the past, and now there more than one. Um, so, maybe it's time now to turn to efforts to explain Thailand's local mess. Um, today, of course, we have a lot of political conflict that we, we experience, and servers disagree about the nature of the conflict. Um, in our book, we include the following figure here, over here, the figure that explaining and summarized the many different accounts that help her to make sense of the mess. Um, we're going to not go through the whole figure here, but we're going to make just two points. The first is that we do not share the popular interpretation that the conflict is relatively straightforward one, that the conflict of establishment elites against supporters of democracy and populist spending and that Thailand's political conflict is driven by class struggle. While we do not think we can make sense of Thai politics without factoring in, half the, um, factoring in its deep inequality, we have to talk about inequalities, of course. But we believe that reducing the story to a conflict between the haves and the have-nots is incomplete, that it is insufficient to understand what is going on here. Second, we draw attention to some of the elements at the bottom of the figure right here, um, which is a political culture. One of the more distinctive things about our book for this age is we take political culture very seriously. Why do we take political culture seriously? Part of the answer, of course, is that because we believe it is important to understand Thai politics, and there are broader issues involved as well. However, including our unhappiness with the state of the discipline of political science, especially in the U.S., and the discipline's general readiness to ignore political culture factors. Also, we wish more, we wish more scholars of comparative politics recognize the importance of 
comparative political analysis of what we see as distinctive, even peculiar elements within Western intellectual traditions. Social science from the West still shapes social science around the world. Norms, not only the sense of should, but also in the sense of what is understood to be typical, rooted in Western cultural and historical experience, still creep into a lot of analysis and acknowledge. We are struck by the tensions between worldviews in which things are knowable, for example, what is the right thing to do, who is the good leader, and those in which such things seem much less knowable. Much of the West tends to fall into the latter group. Can we identify the right position to take in response to this problem? People disagree on that. So then they decide to take a vote. Many times, many of us, however, many may fit better in the first group, in which many people believe they can identify the better position, and in particular, the better person. If it were clear to us all that, you know, all of, and all of us agree on what's good and what is bad, who were good and wise people and who were not good, we would not need elections. If it was clear to all of us that all of us agreed what constitutes a good society and what did not, we would give more emphasis to design but not the process. More to socialism and less to market-produced results. Enlightenment in the West tended to undermine ideas of substantive rationality, of faith that we know of what was best. As a result, Westerners over time rely increasingly on procedural rationality, letting elections or legal procedures or even markets significantly shape outcomes. Many students of Western society argue that this sort of reliance on procedural reason along with the whole modernization package carries cost also. Max Weber referred to the iron cage associated with modernity and the loss of enchantment. By the time that Frederick the Great, the king of Prussia, could describe himself as the first servant of the state, Westerners were disciplining themselves and being disciplined by the state and by civil society and by market society to such a degree that many of them have become what the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore described as compressed bales of humanity. The deepening hegemony of instrumental reasons subjected society, argued the Frenchman Jacques Ellul, to technique requiring the application of impersonal criteria for making policy decisions. Robert Merton, an American, uh, suggested that industrial societies were producing progressive dehumanization busy, pointless, and in the end, suicidal submission to technique. Have ties been exposed to comparable forces being twisted and compressed into bales of humanity? Yeah, of course they have uh, been exposed to these kinds of forces, but perhaps um, so far the impact has been less great. Ruth Benedict uh, granted ancient study, but in that famous study of uh, Thai uh, culture, she concluded that Thais were enjoying life beyond the confines of Weber's iron cage. Um, she described Thais as having few cultural in inventions of self-castigation and meaning of self-indulgence and merriment. Our book argues that Thais, Thai leaders, Thai society, have not embraced modernity with enormous conviction. And comparatively, it seems to us that uh, Thais are, have, have not embraced it with uh, single-minded intensity uh, that we see in some other societies. John Rawls suggested that Westerners put their trust in the capacity of reason to yield truth by using procedural reason since, and here I'm pointing him, since there is neither a higher nor a deeper reality to which we could appeal. Well, what happens if you live in a context where there is a deeper reality to which you can more readily appeal, in which you have strong hints as to who is the best and what is best? 
what then are your incentives for accepting procedural things, including elections that bring to power our pleasant people? You then have fears of the sort articulated by Lecky, as you heard a moment ago, Lecky the liberal, dishonest and predatory adventurers climbing by popular suffrage into positions of great power. Let's turn to the other issue we raised earlier, um, our desire to pay attention not only to institutions, not only to formal institutions. Things like electoral systems, party systems, regime types, and constitutions. But also to informal institutions and to political culture. There are four points about Thai political culture that we discussed it in the book. First. We pay attention quite a bit of, um, quite a lot, to what we term as personalism in Thailand, which is the tendency to avoid abstraction or principles in favor of understanding, concretized, in specific social arrangements. Minimal comfort with impersonal procedural arrangements and a preference for arrangements infused with human warmth. The second point is the emphasis on leaders' morality, on good people and being able to distinguish those who are good and those who are not. And the third point, uh, we talk about the importance of informal institutions and the recognition that formal institutions often fail, not because they are poorly designed, but because they are not supported by informal institutions. The fourth point is the importance of the monarchy. This issue, of course, is important and not easily summarized. Like many observers, we are aware of respects in which the institution has been supportive of democracy, for example, by providing third-party enforcement of social bargains, and therefore greater political stability. In other respects also, for example, the argument that Thais have leaned heavily on the institution rather than developing the skills necessary to resolve their own conflict. Compared to many analysts, our emphasis is heavier on the benefit of the benefit associated with the institution. We take seriously, for example, the conservatives' argument that Thailand has fared very well over the last 70 years relative to other paradigm with these countries. And that the institution has been important in understanding why. We hope that our approach to try to understand the Thai case leads us to pose questions not necessarily asked that often by other scholars. For example, take the question, What's wrong with Thai democracy anyway? It seems to us that almost the standard answer starts by talking about a too strong state and then goes on to talk about the regular occurrence of coups that vitiated any chance for democratic institutions to develop over time. There's something there, sure. The stock answer does not seem wrong to us. Think of Hamlet, who in Shakespeare's play suggested to his mother that she assume a virtue if you have it not, for use can almost change the stamp of nature. In other words, one important part of learning to be a good citizen in a democracy or good leaders in a democracy is to have the opportunity to regularly practice through elections, meetings, petitions, and so on. The key point is that one way to learn to do democracy is uh, is by doing it. That is, it is difficult to do when democracy keeps suffering from interruptions due to coups. So we find this too many coups argument compelling. But we also are inclined to ask other questions, such as, why have Thai voters made the, in our view, often bad choices they have made? Why have political leaders not even toxic, not pushed for more taxation, for more social welfare policies? Why has Thai civil society not been stronger? Why has the military generally been the most respected state institution in Thailand, certainly relative to political parties or mass media? 
Why have elected leaders so often made it so easy for the military, seeking an excuse to take power, to find one? Our book is not a comparative study in any discipline sense, but it does make use of a lot of comparative examples, looking at other countries and other times. We're hoping that those examples make the book useful for readers who may know the Thai case well, but uh, may be relatively unfamiliar with other cases. But for all our insistence on the importance of paying attention to political cultural elements specific to the Thai case, we also believe it is important to understand that Thailand is now in a peculiar, uh, sorry, in a particular context, one that uh, has many features similar to those that confront other countries today, uh, and similar to those that confronted many other countries in the past. The most obvious example is that Thailand is shifting from a democracy that was rooted in low levels of political participation to a democracy rooted in higher levels of political participation. In many ways, this shift is similar to the experience of European political systems in the 19th or early 20th centuries. In many of those cases, the question was, who gets the vote? Because there were various struggles uh, to expand the franchise. The Thai, claim, the Thai case is a lot closer to a German sort of case, where everybody had to vote. All men had to vote in Germany relatively early on. Uh, so the fight in that kind of a case is not about expansion of the suffrage, but about making the legislature powerful. And in many of these European cases, German kinds of cases, the lower house in particular was very weak. Um, often subjected to the power's uh, dominance by the unelected upper house. So in our chapter on the law, um, we argue that ties need to come to terms with reliance on impersonal norms, even when those imply tyrannical indifference to the particular needs of the individual. Or we need to come to terms with the disconcerting notion of blind justice. A Bank of Post columnist tried to account for what struck her as a peculiar queuing behavior of women in restrooms. Rather than form a single line in front of the, um, the stall slot, you know, we usually take a chance of queuing in front of the door each, each stall. Why? She explained that these women prefer space be left for chance or for personal manipulation. She argued that Thais understand the concept of rule of law, but they often prefer arrangements that allow for the effect of choice, karma, for something personal, charisma, or connections, or personality cult. Stronger rule of law in Thailand will require legal equality of citizens, curbing widespread illegal behaviors, more clearly separating legal from political institutions and enabling citizens to rely on law rather than patrons for security. In our chapter on law, we also discussed Thailand's post-political constitutions, beginning with 1997 constitutions, creation of a host of institutions decided to offer more horizontal accountability, institutional such as the constitutional courts, and anti-corruption commission, that aim to tame executive power. These kinds, of these kinds of institutions are designed to cope with the problems of overly powerful executives, such as Latin America's super presidents in their delegative democracies, as well as problems of low accountability and high corruption. They're supposed to tame leaders such as Erdogan in Turkey, Putin in Russia, Menem in Argentina, Paxson in Thailand, but generally they haven't managed all that well. Michai Richupan said of the 1997 Constitution that to him it read like a foreign import. He was skeptical that it wouldn't, that it would work well. It didn't. Is his version going to do any better? A lot of Thai politics has for more than two decades, really a lot longer, been about battles over corruption, uh, battles over constitutions or amending constitutions. Certainly, some, this is something of which we are all very aware at the moment. 
All right, when the Ying Lak government was in power, the Constitutional Court rejected its bid to amend the Constitution to create fully elected Senate, as you remember and recall. The court's reasoning rested largely on procedural grounds, but it also noted that a fully elected Senate would undermine Thailand's fragile checks and balance. No doubt the court was thinking about all those relatives of the executive branch people, um, member, and um, who were in supposedly nonpartisan Senate by 2006. Most common of the court's decision criticized the court's clearly undemocratic spirit. Relatively few acknowledge what seems to us the undeniable soundness of their point that if you want to have a second chamber in your legislature, isn't the point to try to make it reflect different interests than does the first chamber? Perhaps even to make it a check on the first chamber or rather than an echo chamber. In general, much public discussion in Thailand, particularly concerning constitutional design, which criticizes that which is less democratic and favors that which is more democratic, as if the extent of democracy was the only yardstick that might be applied in evaluations of policy choices or institutional design. Couldn't we also ask for choices we believe would have a decent chance of working, of lasting for a while? We might be forgiven when we listen to these criticisms of the undemocratic spirit of particular institutional arrangements for assuming that we're talking about a case where democracy has a long and rich record of substantial uh, provision of quality service to the needs of the Thai people. In fact, however, we believe the record has been fairly fit. Very controversial. Hopefully we'll have a chance to challenge that when we are done. Um, in our fifth chapter, we talk about a lot of issues. And we'll spend some time uh, today touching on some of these. Some of the issues from chapter five concern how Thais engage in debate and political contest, how they deliberate, how they use information, how much access to information they have, and the nature of Thai mass media. One of our arguments is that censorship, the less majesté and defamation laws are crippling for sure, no doubt about that, but they do not by themselves fully account for the opaque, what we believe to be the opaque qualities of Thai political discourse. In this chapter, we also discuss the impact of enchantment, of violence, and Thai deliberative styles for general. When Japan's uh, Meiji oligarch, uh, Soho Tokotomi, made a visit to um, Europe uh, late in the 19th century, he described what he thought he was seeing, which were information-rich public cultures of inquiry and debate. Our analysis in this chapter suggests that if Soho were to make a trip to Thailand even today, we don't think he would be making the same observation. This is a big problem because quality information really, in our view, it constitutes a um, collective good. And especially for citizens who have limited access to such information, um, it's, it, uh, or I should say, uh, limited means of ferreting out this information themselves. The provision of such information is especially important. Uh, so, if there's a scarcity, those sorts of citizens are, are penalized. And again, I want to repeat that we don't see this as being an issue simply of Section 112, and not just a problem of the nature of Thai media, but it seems to us that it involves many other factors that are specific to, to how Thais talk to and debate with one another. A lot of evidence indicates that we are not very well informed politically. Yes, they are very interested in politics, we are all, and consume much political news and discussion. Yes, a lot of us have awakened for that a lot. We learn a lot about things that is going on. But so much reporting is stronger on intensity and passion and emotion, feelings, 
rather than on reflection. That you can probably read messages and texts on your phone for a long time, for a couple of hours, but not learning very much from what you read. So very few, very few of us rely in the past much on newspapers for their news, now even fewer to do so. Most depend on television or, or internet nowadays. For many years, until a decade ago, uh, Thai, Thais mostly consumed what state control broadcasting chose to present to them. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, that's all we had. Some, some channel 3, channel 7, um, channel 9, um, that's all compared to now. Even a young adult, no? <laughs> <laughs> Um, now we have much more the worst, but far more, far from ideal situation in which many people get their news overwhelmingly from sources such as ASTV, a new year, voice TV, or social media. We are reminded of the character in one of the Turkish writers. His name is Orhan Pamuk. He wrote a novel. He offered an explanation of why he had assassinated someone used a reason that he said, I listen to flat radio all day long. So you have been hearing a lot of healing sending through the past couple of days. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, we talk about enchantment um, in this chapter. We're talking about the realm of karmic burdens, spirits, celestial forces, unobservable actors who cannot readily held accountable. Clearly they're compelling, they're charismatic, um, and maybe they help to explain why ties like politics so much. They're interesting. But if ties give so much attention to otherworldly actors, that implies that at least for some ties, uh, they may have less time, less energy for attention to this world of actors. If fate is in the hands of other world there is little that most ties can do about it. If so many owe so much to such inaccessible forces, there seem to be relatively low incentives for citizen activists. Thailand has gone through um, many coups, many of them with minimal violence or no violence. However, its politics also have, at times, have been marked by a fair share of bloodshed. Even when the blood's not flowing, it may be curdling in our veins when we listen to the violence of much political rhetoric. In relatively recent times, we had the UDD splashing blood in 2010, coffin burning, cursing ceremonies. PDRC was marching and demanding positive coverage from government-owned television stations. Their tactics of intimidation were similar to those of the Latwa movement in Finland about a hundred years ago. Um, the, this movement went through uh, Finland uh, giving orders to governors, using violence, mostly against communists, uh, forcing the state radio broadcaster uh, in Helsinki to allow them to address the nation. On social media, as elsewhere, we have abundant hate speech, for example, with Thailand's stylized street theater politics, the street protesters, or at least their leaders, often seem to be seeking violence. The authorities of the day are avoiding it. The people on the street seem to want it. And the political speech can be blood curdling. There will be blood on the street if the government does not call off the dispersal operations. Our patience is running out. It will take more serious measures to retaliate. The sky will turn red, red like blood. To an audience in Chiang Mai, grab those gasoline tanks and let's go to Bangkok and burn the place down. Not the liberation, is in the sense that we use to think of them. Send in your army divisions and kill the people. There will be blood everywhere. The nation will rise up. Bring it on. Come on, come on. Nice. Oh. 
three more points to make that derive from Chapter 5. We um, generally have poor quality deliberations that are similar to the description of German shouting match in the 1930s, a time when political debate was reduced to battles with the expectation that the loudest would prevail, who shout the loudest. Chiang Mai, the nation columnist, ran a title many years ago that expressed this mood in Thailand. And his title is if I shout loud enough, I won't hear you. Perhaps this style of deliberation is infectious, though. It seems to be cropping up in many different countries around the world now. Before the 2011 elections, the Democrats <coughs> hoped to have Ding Lak debate, Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Abhisit on TV. In explaining why that was not going to happen, one per Thai leader asked, how can we put in place reconciliation in this country if we let people argue or quarrel in front of the public? His question not only showed little appreciation for the deliberative elements of democracy, but also foreshadowed the current military's apparent thinking about the referendum 12 days from now. We can't let you talk about it because that would not serve the goal of reconciliation. Also interesting was the comment of Chalom, if you remember. He explained why his plan, uh, his planned submission of a no-confidence motion against Abhisit government was suspended in 2010. Um, he wanted, he said, after he talked, he talked on the phone with the Dubai guy, to avoid distracting attention from the more critical street demonstrations aimed at bringing down government. Instead of deliberations, we have bloody street theater. Arthur Meltzer, this is a book that came out a couple of years ago, uh, argues that in the West, until two or three hundred years ago, uh, there was an established tradition of being obscure in writing about some subjects in order to avoid damaging communities by subverting their essential myths and traditions. Learned people, he suggested, wrote between the lines, simultaneously writing for a more general audience, but with the expectation that only the particularly educated would get to what was in sometimes their particular view. Um, Westerners now live in open societies and no longer believe it is dangerous to expose myths. Westerners love to expose myths. Debunking myths is a very popular phrase in the West, and it's a popular pastime. But this maybe is not necessarily true everywhere, particularly in uh, more traditional societies, where analysis of sacred elements is viewed by some um, as being uh, threatening. Examination of unexamined illusions is seen as uh, anxiety. A different point. We are struck with how often um, different views about Thai politics are ascribed to or are explained in terms of failures of understanding. I think the, the example that uh, I have run across most frequently is people telling me that uh, foreigners criticize the coup in 2014 in Thailand, foreigners criticize um, restrictions on free speech in Thailand because foreigners don't understand Thailand. Which obviously begs the question, why is it that Thais, who perhaps are able to understand the great mysteries of Thailand, why is it that Thais, also some Thais, oppose the coup in 2014 and oppose the limits on free speech? We're not convinced that every time there is a difference of opinion, it can be accounted for by the fact that some people know and other people don't get it. There seems to be a failure to appreciate the fact that frequently differences arise from different weightings and values, from the bringing to bear of different sets of theoretical assumptions, uh, from different interpretations. If you were to 
ask me, I'm from the United States, uh, if you were to ask me why um, so many Americans are supporting Donald Trump, I may, this may not be correct, but I really don't think I would typically begin my answer or end my answer by saying, well, they don't understand the United States. Or they don't understand the immigration issues. Or they don't understand international trade. Uh, but it seems to me that there is a tendency frequently to explain differences of views here in terms of some people get it, some people don't. All right, moving on to political participation. Access to the formal institutions of participatory democracy does not guarantee any great increase in political participation. In Thailand, for the bulk of the country, fuller participation did not really come until Thaksin. In India, it did not really come until after the death of Nehru, more than uh, almost two decades uh, after Indian independence. And in the United States, it did not really come until the presidency of Andrew Jackson, the seventh US president. When it came in India, in the United States, the consequences were um, not always loving. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know that uh, we would not necessarily sing the praises of many of the people who hold seats in the Indian legislature today, or the U.S. one, perhaps. Um, the adjustments involved in shifting from a political system characterized by low levels of political participation in a democracy to higher levels can be tough, especially if, as in Thailand, and in contrast to India and the United States, political institutions are not particularly strong political party systems in particular. Thailand was quite successful, if we think in terms of social stability and high economic growth, for half a century. And it was successful based on a model that involved low levels of political participation, elite consensus, and sustained social stability. So the challenge in Thailand now is to make the transition to a system having higher levels of political inevitably weaker elite, uh, elite consensus, but still an adequate degree of social stability and economic growth. That shift is necessary for a stronger democracy to emerge, but so far it has involved more than a few serious bumps along the way. Hopefully Thailand's higher levels of political participation will not doom it to its current string of publicitary uh, populist politics. Populist leaders tend to boil issues down. Uh, sorry, uh, populist politics tend to boil down to single issues. Usually, do you like the leader or don't you? This is somewhat similar to referendum voting, an issue that got quite a lot of attention with the Brexit vote uh, a couple of weeks ago. Was that? You argue that Thailand's challenges are threefold. Widening a political nation of political inclusion, the shift to higher levels of political participation, building institutions, and consolidating democratic procedures, and devising a more sustainable model of politics, the model, the model that corruption and rent-seeking are more moderate. Some critics of yellow shirts the PDRC and the current government argue that corruption is not all serious an issue in Thailand, but one that conservatives emphasize for their own purposes. We believe that that view is mistaken. How many rich countries do you know that have corruption as the same level as in Thailand? Thailand's past record of economic success and social stability rested on a number of factors that have either long since disappeared, uh, for example, relative asset equality at the very beginning, in the middle of the 20th century, of the period of rapid economic growth, or have disappeared more recently. Low levels of political participation, no longer. Elite consensus, no longer. If we think about the century-old ideological troika 
that sought to define Thailand politically, national identity, religion, monarchy. You can see how much has changed in Thailand and is changing. We used to argue that Thailand has a single strong national identity, but with assertions of regionalism, of Lana and Lao identities, now some of us may be less certain about that. Buddhism once was the backbone of so much Thai social continuity, but the Sangha has been riddled for decades with scandals and the case of Damakai is truly extraordinary. Men no longer become monks for three months or even two weeks in very large numbers compared to the past. So, well, the Thai colors, once red, white, and blue, what would they be in the future? Still have red, but the white and the blue right, seem to have faded by uh, comparison. Thailand is experiencing rapid structural and value changes. Education has risen quickly, poverty has fallen, the centrality of rural life has fallen, traditional values have weakened, social dualism is going to continue to diminish as well. No question. Major demographic shifts happen. So what lies ahead? The current military regime has little in the way of a political vision that we can identify. Um, beyond uh, celebration of the past and maybe some element of an East Asia-like pro-business orientation. The regime is politically isolated. Uh, there is relatively little open support from other actors such as intellectuals or political parties compared to similar coup regimes in the past. Its key ally seems to be business. So is this the basis for an effective bureaucratic authoritarian regime in Thailand? Is there um, an incipient coalition ready to demand less corruption and better state, to state performance, at least for economic management? Thinking of Japan's LDP in the 1950s, the National Alliance in Malaysia at about the same time. Um, this question is interesting to us in part because in Chapter 3 we consider four explanations for the emergence of high capacity states. Um, some of these will be familiar to many of you. Uh, one of them was high incidence of war, hence the need to develop capacities to field armies and to raise taxes to pay for them. Second one being the requirements of capitalism, becoming responsive to demanding investors. The third bottom-up explanation emphasizes the sort of social discipline associated in Europe and particularly in the Netherlands, Prussia, and uh, England with a Calvinist form of Protestantism. Then this fourth explanation, which tends to put the explanation for the emergence of high-capacity states in terms of supportive coalitions that emerge in response to serious threats to their interests from mass-based urban interests. So we couldn't help but think about whether or not Thailand's political turmoil, turmoil mass-based urban uh, unrest might usher in some kind of coalition comparable to uh, Again, Malaysia, Japan in the 1950s. Ultimately, I think we're fairly skeptical about that possibility, partly because we just don't see Thai business actors as the Thai social actors in general as having strong enough corporatist elements. Uh, they were there in Malaysia, they were there in Japan, in Thailand, I don't think um, they're there. That's a little bit obscure by way of explanation we might talk about uh, further later. Um, we do consider briefly in our conclusion five possible regime types for Thailand's future. Bureaucratic authoritarian is one of them. So the first two we, we mentioned are liberal democratic, social democratic. Um, we dismiss these as being un, unlikely anytime very soon. Uh, bureaucratic authoritarian, which uh, I just mentioned, and then elected authoritarian populist or elite 
pluralism, refereeing from above, essentially the kinds of regimes that we're uh, familiar with more recently. And indeed, we conclude that the last two, uh, uh, elected authoritarian populist and elite pluralism, refereeing from above, seem to us to be the most likely for the medium uh, term future. It's an unimaginative conclusion, um, but uh, we uh, end up arguing that some form of overlordship is going to be likely necessary in Thai politics over the medium term. And that's it. So, um, Thank you very much, Professor Daniel, Professor Chantrado, for a very um, interesting presentation of the book. Um, is it in the market now, the book? Not in the Thai market. Not in the Thai market, yet. Or? <laughs> I don't know if it will. Okay. I don't, I, we haven't really looked into this. Amazon, either. Oh, maybe you can buy it from Amazon. Right. Yes. Okay. So that's one way to get a hold of this book. Very interesting. Um, so Professor um, Daniel and Professor Chen Chuan Lut has vividly painted a picture of political culture development in Thailand. Um, how modernization does not necessarily mean the successful um, democratization process in certain countries. Um, as we may witness, we have political polarizations even before 1932 when absolute monarchy is ended. And maybe modernization has played little role in you know, fielding or intensifying, uh, intensifying this uh, polarization even. Um, we would open the floor for questions um, from the audience. Um, would you like to take questions one at a time or three questions? Why don't we try on um, uh, one, one at a time, time first? Yes. yes, and please introduce yourself, whether you're a student or whether you're, you know, professors and your organization,
depending on how you define it. You were mentioning about participation in the United States, the most correct. Participation in the United States, perhaps the highest in the world. But uh, I was, uh, um, uh, just want to say that uh, you mentioned about elite several times. But elites are everywhere. Uh, you can see the elites in bureaucracy, in the military, in business, large corporation. So uh, it's not a Thailand included. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so I. I just want to point out, even in the United States, you can see elites in the Congress, most of them, uh, elites one way or another. Uh, you can see the uh, strong bureaucracy uh, in the State Department and State, uh, Department of Defense, and the military military role in the United States is quite subtle than in Thailand. They did not have um, to uh, stage a coup. They did not stage a coup. But the military industrial complex has been there since the end of, uh, is the end of Second World War. President Eisenhower mentioned that himself. There were large budget from the Department of Defense in cooperation with big corporates producing war weapons and uh, all kinds of uh, defense equipment. Uh, it has been a, a large phenomenon of the United States. That's, uh, I think that that's a role military in the United States, which is also an elite role. And uh, of course, the, uh, the the big corporation, the big corporation is uh, lurking in the wings. They were controlling uh, the policies of several governments from behind, in line with the neoliberal market-driven economy. That, in fact, they were behind the scene. Uh, of several government, especially in foreign affairs. Uh, so, uh, what I was I'm trying to say is not to compare Thailand with the United States. The uh, United States has been so much advanced in democracy, especially in participation of the uh, people. But I just would like to point out that the role of the elite, uh, be it civilian democracy cooperation, are there uh, in practically every part of the world. So instead of, uh, if I detect you correctly, that you have rather gloomy uh, ideas of democracy in Thailand, uh, I incline to, to uh, go along with you. But I would like to point out that we have had, we had an experience of different kind of uh, government, uh, uh, military intervention, uh, money politics, Politicians that control large uh, parties and acting almost like authoritarian. We had uh, some brief period of, of democracy uh, after the Second World War and a brief period of democracy after October the 4th in 1973. So uh, these kind of things are uh, it's a big bag of several types of democracy uh, in Thailand.
kind of as democracy is a, is a catchword that everybody was trying to refer to. So it, it seems to me that uh, they take turns, they take turns around, take turns, and uh, uh, it has become more or less a, a cyclical phenomenon uh, rather than a, a rather concept of democracy as you have presented, uh, that uh, is, is, is just a way that, that one of these days we might have this kind of, of things, uh, take turns coming back, and then democracy can go on uh, to a certain extent, although it might be a brief period again. And also this is a kind of a cyclical phenomenon that I would like to point out. Thank you. Thank you so much again for those comments. Um, I guess maybe I might respond with just a couple of points, um, if it's okay, that um, I wanted to assure you and everybody else here that I am a card-carrying member of a political science group. Um, I can show you my union card right here in my wallet. Uh, so we're not really so naive as to imagine that uh, there are lots of political systems out there where there are no elites. Uh, we understand that, uh, and I don't think we even intended to use the term elites in a pejorative sense. I, we were mostly being descriptive. I, uh, I don't believe that we wanted to suggest that what was distinctive about Thailand's political system was that there were elites in Thailand as opposed to in the United States. Um, and I, I guess the only other point that I would make is that um, I think in most of our comparisons, we, um, we both spent a lot of time in the United States. Who knows to what degree unconsciously US comparisons were influencing our thinking. But in, uh, in our explicit comparisons, we were mostly looking at non-U.S. cases, partly because the U.S. is a presidential system rather than a parliamentary one. Just the United States is such a peculiar case in so many ways. Um, but I would also add that um, if you were asking me what would be examples of cases with very high levels of political participation, the U.S. would not be one of the first cases that would come to mind. I, I could cite many other democracies that have higher levels of political participation. It depends on which type we were talking about, but many types of political participation than does the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Fitz. I'm a former diplomat and uh, a, sub, a, a bit of an academic, but now I'm just a consultant. Um, you mentioned something that you said might be controversial. Uh, you hinted that perhaps elected governments haven't served uh, Thai society, uh, haven't been uh, the best service to Thai society as compared to other governments. Uh, I would observe on the economic front that the, the major decisions that have that have led in the past to Thailand's economic advancement, the power policy, uh, the uh, Eastern Seaboard, uh, and then I would argue currently a very important decision, which is to introduce even a modest land and uh, buildings tax, have been made by non-elected governments. And I struggle to find similar decisions that were made by elected governments. So I appreciate your take on how um, how reforms and advancement have been achieved under elected, elected governments. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> the, uh, I think we could run that list out at, at greater length than, uh, you know, as people used to say in the 1980s, that I mean, the typical comments about Thailand's political economy were that uh, even in the 1980s as parliament was growing stronger and so on, that the key macroeconomic policy decisions were kept with the technocrats. 
Um, and indeed, uh, leading up to 1997, that began to weaken somewhat and was certainly partly a factor in making 1997 possible. Um, I bet that if we put our mind to it, we could come up with some uh, uh, additional uh, examples of uh, elected governments doing things we approve of, both economic and non-economic. In terms of uh, the non-economic, uh, I mean, is it economic? I mean, if you want to make the argument that in the longer term, sustainable, strong economic growth in Thailand is going to require a less unequal income distribution, you could uh, talk about the value of some of Toxin's policies and maybe pretty modest, but some steps toward economic redistribution. Uh, in the 1970s, of course, there were the uh, Social Action Party's uh, initiative to create the Tumblr funds. Uh, not a huge step, but providing opportunities for local spending. Um, the Democrats were the, in power when they initiated the social security system uh, in Thailand. Um, but um, your point um, certainly seems to be convincing about, especially the last, I mean, this, the last 10 years at least, where uh, governments have been so weak and so preoccupied, distracted, that uh, not much has gotten done. And it has been gratifying um, for all of the failure of this government to do anything about political reconciliation that we can see or that I can see. Uh, they've done a lot of useful things for business, for the economy uh, in, in the medium term. That tax, I've been so thrilled that that tax finally passed. I wish it wasn't so timid, but uh, it's good to have something. Kevin Downey, uh, right here on BMIR. Uh, I want to come back to the lease for just a moment. And the question is not whether one system has a lease and another system doesn't, because that doesn't exist, as you said. It's the relationship between the population and the elites. One personal opinion, I won't even give a definition, say it's a definition, is that democracy at its heart is devolving power to the people in more substantial ways. Got to keep doing it. That's what I believe. So the question is, what is the relationship between population, voting population, possibly it doesn't have to be. I'm American too. I'm not going to make any apologies for my electoral system at the moment. Um, but but we all know that you need elites to, to run states. I mean, it's just it's so it's I'm opening up a can of worms, but. People need to be in charge. I don't know if anybody else has seen Idiocracy, but President Camacho in the future, who's a, world, who's a wrestler, can't run the government because he's not, you know, he's not prepared. So you know, you got a hierarchy. Let's just say there's a hierarchy. You need it. What's the relationship between the people and the hierarchy? The difference between what you would say an effective democracy is and a less effective democracy, like maybe Thailand, as you insinuate. What's the different relationship between people who, are, who should be having more power and the people who actually run the show for them? to say, but I will just start with the political science boilerplate, uh, but indeed I think it's a pretty substantial part of the answer to that question, which is that uh, historically, this is becoming less true clearly, but historically it's all, not all, substantially been about political party systems, that where you have strong political party systems, strong individual parties, but strong political party systems, uh, the uh, diverse preferences of individuals get much more representation and you have more accountability and uh, more responsiveness and so on. Uh, so you know, the classic 
political science answer. It's the institutions, and usually people are talking about the formal institutions. It's a big part of the answer. Just continue from your point that the Supreme Court has been interest aggregation, interest, you know, show people knows what they want, what's good for the public, that is good from grassroots, it doesn't really happen here. Um, in order to form a political party, a strong ideology, political party with ideology that you can, that help people choose. So right now we have political parties, but we choose between good party and bad party. We don't choose between, the, in terms of the stand of an issue, you know, like, okay, the, the free casino policy, this party, what, what's your stand? That party, what's your stand? There's no such things here. So people doesn't really learn through that process that actually happened in America or, you know, developed countries. So I agree with you about it. It needs comments that it's everywhere. Just a relationship. So our political parties was found from GG Board and you know, people down there that don't learn through the process of interest articulation or trying to push their interest through the top of the decision maker. Let me just add one point. I mean, you sort of pose the question, encourage us to think of it in terms of dyadic quality, you know, the encapsulation of the relationship between the top and the bottom of this uh, pyramid. And very often, of course, people want to look at it by you know, looking at the top, what are the problems with readers. In this book, we probably spent quite a bit of time looking at the bottom, what are the problems with the bottom of it. And we think that there are uh, problems. Uh, there are there are historical uh, inheritances that make some kinds of formal institutions, make it harder to get them going and working well. Including um, limited degrees of horizontal solidarities. Um, yes, I think you mentioned a lot about elite consensus. I would like to ask about the, seem like that okay, have a lot of consensus, I mean, in terms of, okay. But I would like to ask about the conflict among elites. I mean, maybe you mentioned in your book or something like that, and what caused in high politics. It's because I think some, many people might agree that maybe the conflicts among the elites cause a lot to high politics. Let's see if this answer starts going in any sort of direction that's interesting or not. But um, the, um, what we were saying was that uh, it seemed to us that uh, not at the level of competition for power, of course it's competition for power, but at a broader level concerning to the extent that people thought about such questions about what sort of institutional arrangement overarching institutional architecture was in place, should was in place, should be in place, and so on. We were suggesting that there was more agreement on those sorts of issues in the past than there seems to be today. Um, so uh, we were not at all trying to suggest that a deep consensus included you know, that everybody agreed that the military should stage another coup and seize power in the 1960s, or that um, everybody agreed which party, uh, which individuals should be in the cabinet, and so on. Of course, there's constantly political fighting, but uh, we were trying to suggest that there were not big fights between part of the elite that was strongly committed to higher levels of taxation, or strongly committed to a radically different kind of foreign policy that was being pursued by the government, um, or indeed that were strongly committed to populist policies. Um, and we were trying to suggest that those sorts of differences then later in this century become more pronounced. So I have the feeling I haven't been saying it, addressing your, your real question. <laughs> um, 
Uh, my name is Yes, I am a student of BAR year one. I uh, do think that the, the problem of the democracy in Thailand is like the, the, the education in Thailand, the collector of it is quite uh, become the authoritarian. So, so I think it does, so the thing that it does is support the context of democracy in the social society. Excuse us, we were distracted for a moment. Could we ask you to rephrase that one more time, please? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, do you think that the problem in democ of democracy in Thailand is the is the educational system? Because the system in Thailand is, it's the the, the system in Thailand is like an authoritarian system because um, you you have to learn what what the teacher is says and you can't have the participation in the in the in the school. Uh, so, so it doesn't match up with the, with the social context of democracy. Education, of course, you know, part of the problem. And, um, but I, I think um, the problem, part of the problem of education is that the, the whole society, you know, in general, they don't, we don't want to take a stand, so there's no debate. So if you, you know, if, if there's no issue-based issue -based debate in, in this country that much. Right, you know, in certain tax, high tax, you want to cut tax, you want to increase tax rate or not. If we don't talk about that, you know, what's good about, you know, taxing people more, and what's bad about taxing people more, what's good about taxing people less, and less taxation. So there's no such, open debate among people in general. And that's probably part of the educational system here that, you know, did you talk teacher? I'm not sure of that. When I was young, you're not supposed to um, you're not supposed to disagree because disagree is very bad. You know? That's a very root cause of the democracy because as we said in the book, you know, in our presentation, we, we don't like debate. And how could you have good policy debate if you don't like to debate it and choose between options? And political party brave enough to choose to take a stand on some issue. Like, okay, you know, this party A want to tax people more, this party B want to tax people less. There's no such distinction here to help people choose what they think is good for them.
Um, let me just make a comment, or maybe a couple comments, uh, possibly not doing what you're asking us to do. But um, as we mentioned earlier, we, we don't see Thailand as being very poor purchased. Um, and so corporatism uh, uh, would be one kind of uh, consultative issue, uh, formal, institutionally based uh, form of uh, consultation. I agree with you that um, most forms of authoritarian regime in Thailand have tended to be quite consultative. We always remark that the uh, Chinese regime was rather exceptional, but it looked kind of like an off the shelf authoritarian regime that you might find in the southern cone of Latin America, uh, but one that was kind of unfamiliar for the Thai case. Um, The question is uh, whether rooted in formal institutions or not, is there anything about the pattern of behavior that makes it more or less likely that these consultations will have the effect of serving broader interests rather than just Here could be helpful uh, to the extent that you have elites afraid that they're going to be able to hold on to power. Um, that's part of the argument about you know, the, the Malaysian examples and the, the Japanese examples. If people are afraid that their relatively good life might, might not survive, they may be willing to be taxed more to provide more benefits that then underpin a more sustainable. Uh, this is not a question, uh, but I just would like to answer the lady over there talking about uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the little country about the elite. Uh, I remember the Clinton Rossiter, uh, Clinton Rossiter, a famous political scientist of the United States in the 50s, once said, there's no democracy without participation. There's no participation without political parties. And I would like to add that there's no political parties without bribery and conflict. Sometimes can uh, become intense and violent, uh, which is why uh, prevalent at this time, especially at the end of the Cold War, when the external threat has been subsiding, the conflict within the country has increased. And this has been manifested in the uh, internal uh, conflicts and rivalries, Thailand included, and even the United States. Uh, polarization has been more intense nowadays. Thank you. Hard to believe, given where we are now today in Japan, but um, in the 
1980s. I mean, this was an era still of LDP dominance, and um, not much memory of the idea that there had ever been what looked almost like an effective two-party system for a while. And a lot of political scientists ask the question, how can Japan ever have a really strong democracy because there's no social cleavages? Everybody seems to want the same thing in terms of public policy. They're all LDP supporters. Uh, and so people used to scratch their heads and think, well, well maybe foreign policy issues someday are going to cleave the Japanese in a, in a significant way. But the notion was that you know, since, 19, since about 1960, and that whole crisis, that there hadn't been any very tractable uh, cleavages in Japan, which means to build a strong party competition and therefore strong to strong democracy.